how are we today? Good morning. How are we? Good. Yeah. Awesome. I am so grateful that you are here this morning spending your time with me. Thank you for being here. So uh, by a show of hands, how many musicians are in the house tonight? Today? Okay. Hey, okay. Awesome. How many visual artists? Wow. Okay. I feel like that was the other half of the room there. Awesome. How many others do we have in the house? <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, whatever your creative art is, I'm really excited to hopefully connect with you, share my story, and maybe even just a little bit of it will resonate with you and be um, something that sends you on your way in your own journey. So um, for me, when I was thinking about trust and the theme for today and my life, there couldn't have been a better theme to have been assigned for this talk. I feel like that's one of those um, through threads that the universe has tried to teach me in this lifetime over and over again. Um, so as I thought about organizing all the details of the past 15 years that I want to share with you or greater, um, for me, trust comes down to a few different things. One, trust in others. Uh, number two, trust in ourselves. Number three, trust in the process of becoming or the journey that we're on. And number four, I'd say trust for me, it's the universe, something greater, something bigger that we have potentially no control over, right? So I think those four things are really, for me, the elements of trust that I think about and I've, I'm hopefully going to have some real life stories to share with you today and how those have happened for me personally. Um, so it all started at the age of three. There I am. Nice bangs, little Alyssa, nice bangs. And that was my very first uh, piano student. Her name was Dinah, and she was not a very good listener. But I loved the piano. I was obsessed with the piano from a very young age. I also was really, really passionate about teaching, even if the student wouldn't listen. So I started piano formally at the age of eight years old, and I began working with this woman right here. Her name is Vera. She was a really special person in my life. Um, Vera and I had exactly 60 years of difference in our age, and um, when I first showed up at her house, I was probably like this tall, and she had these big, thick glasses, scared the absolute crap out of me. She said, sit down, play for me, you know, and I played for Elise, I think, or something, and didn't do a very good job, and she looks at my mom, and she says, she's got a little bit, but I'll, we'll work on it, uh, and so that was the beginning of our amazing friendship, and um, actually, ironically, the reason I was not here in 2019, is that as Vera got older, she lost very tragically all of her family. And so I adopted her and her, her older years as a part of mine, like a grandma. And I took care of her and I took on that responsibility of being there with her. I promised her at 17 years old, I would not let her die alone because she had lost all of her family. I feel like for a lot of us, the thought of being alone in, your, in our older years is really scary. And I know I was only 17, but I, I felt it very deeply for her. And so her health declined pretty suddenly. And it was that week, actually the morning I was supposed to speak, I was next to Vera and she passed away. So it's a very interesting story, very beautiful. But if it wasn't for this woman, I wouldn't have developed all of that ability to play the piano and express myself and then share that joy with others through the work I do today. So. A uh, really amazing person in my life. And um, this is another amazing woman I have to pay some credit to. She's going to come up in this story a couple more times. So this is my grandma, everyone. Um, she was a safe place for me. She was a safe person. She was a huge reason that I was uh, as uh, passionate and able to play the piano as I am because her house always had a piano that was open for me at any time. And so throughout many years, many experiences, no matter what was going on at home, I was always able to go to her house and to play her piano. So piano for me, and I'm sure for many of us in the room, would you agree that your creative arts are your safe place, right? It's our place to be completely unabashedly ourselves, completely authentic to who we are, to self-express, to process. Would you all say that? It's super special, right? Like who would we be without our art? So I have to pay these two women a lot of credit. Um, so the ride to 20 years old for me was pretty rough, and I'm going to save you a lot of details, but I can tell you that um, up until about 20 years old, I held it together. I tried to be the Alyssa that I felt like everybody wanted me to be. Who can relate to that? Who's had chapters where you were completely not yourself? 
but maybe a reflection of everyone else around you, what you thought they wanted you to be. And then there's this hollowness. Do you guys feel that too? When you start to become awake to that, you started to recognize, I'm empty. I am a shell of myself. That was me at 20. I was in what I call my dark age, my Great Depression. I'm glad I'm still here today, honestly. It was that rough and in the spirit of being completely authentic and mental health awareness. Like, whew, that was that was a, a tricky, tricky chapter for me. We got through it, but at 20 years old, I asked myself, what am I doing? Who am I? How am I gonna stay alive another day? This is not okay, right? And the only thing I could think of was what is my joy? And the only thing that was my joy was the piano, was music, was my art. And so I decided to blindly follow that first moment of exercising trust, trust in the process, trust in myself. And I applied to uh, Berkeley. And I thought, I'm going to go back to music school because if I do music school and I get a degree, people will take me seriously. There's no way people will take me seriously if I don't have a degree, right? I got rejected from Berkeley, but then I tried to get into their five-week program to try to get some of my playing back. I had gone to business school, graduated early again, was not, not really happy. So when you're not happy, you get through things quicker. All right, so I get to Boston. My car is still packed from my undergrad uh, dorm room. And I have big dreams. Those dreams quickly died as soon as I got into my mouse-infested apartment in Alston with the two ladies that I did not care for that I was living with. <sighs> Reality settled in very fast. Whew, this is going to be tougher than I thought. And so I worked. I took any job I could. I actually, who knows the Dunkin' Donuts across from um, Berkeley? Yeah. <laughs> That was my first job here in Boston. I had a whole bachelor's degree in business administration. Here I was at Dunkin' Donuts serving coffee. And then I was working for free for a design firm, which I'm pretty sure now, at the age I'm at, I look back, that was totally illegal, but it's all good. That's gonna come become a big part of the story in just a second. And then at night, I said yes to doing modeling for alcohol companies like Bacardi and Coors Light. I'm out there, you know, hey, who wants a beer? Okay. And then by 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm up doing it all again, classes, until finally I'm falling asleep on the desk at Berkeley. And I have to withdraw from the one thing that I moved here for. And the effort of hustling and trying to be okay in this very expensive city as a creative, doing what I love, I had to actually withdraw. Ah, so who knows the band OK Go? Ah, OK, we're, 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 I, all right, we're, we're, I'm dating myself a little bit. Right, they did like the, the viral treadmill video, right? Everyone remember that? So Damien, the head singer, ironically, I'm driving him and like breaking down Nissan Altima to Berkeley. And he asked me a simple question. He said, how are you? Oh, Damien did not know what he was in for. <laughs> Ooh, I'm so tired. I think he was immediately fearing for his life because I'm in the driver's seat. He said, oh, okay, all right, all right, it's going to be all right. And so I think he saw in me someone who was really struggling, who just really wanted life to be different. And he said, I'm going to set you up with my dear friend, the chief marketing officer at Berkeley Online. She's going to have a meeting with you, and we're going to get you a real job. <laughs> and so I had a meeting, and guess what? One day, six months later, I'm in that big girl job. That's great. I get fired. <laughs> Why was I fired? because I'm utterly unemployable. I have been my whole life. I'm an entrepreneur. And no one pointed that out to me. Uh, and that's okay. No one's supposed to point these things out to us. That's the journey of life, right? And so upon getting fired, they cited the reason was I was distracted. I wasn't doing a great job. And it's true, what was I doing? I was writing my business plan for my dream music studio, Musician's Playground. And so, I took this moment to think long and hard. What am I doing with my life? I need to figure this out. And I put up some ads on Craigslist. Wow, that's like back in the day. I'm really dating myself now. And I drove to random strangers' homes. And I taught a lot of piano. And I did that for a lot of years. Uh, I'd say a couple years, maybe not a lot. OK, two years. And then there was a moment where I realized I was probably taking a loss on my time driving for all those 
minutes in the car and not getting paid and then charging a very, very modest rate for my expertise. Where I said, I need to bring people to me. I'm going to invest in my own hand and bring those to you. And so at this point, I, this woman here on the screen, um, God bless her, she helped me to have a little bit of a cushion. And she deposited the money every year, a modest amount in a, an account for me. So I had a little savings because of her. And then I went to Steinway, of all places. That's not a place you want to go when you have a little savings. And I said, I want to do it all. I'm a parent. Like, I'm ready, ready to buy my own. And I said, sure. And so they were, what's your budget? And I'm sending it to you. Not very thrilled. Then there's one with a cape in the corner. And I'm like, oh, what's that? Don't go there. And I play. I'm like, I'm in love. I have to have it. Like any creative who's unhinged would say. And they said, okay, well, let's double your budget. Because I'll be right back. I walk to Bank of America, who knows this one, across from the Prudential. Oh, okay. And I am sitting across from the teller saying, I am a marketing consultant. I make $250,000 and I need a big line increase. And she says, you're approved. I said, oh my God. And so I walk out and I go into Steinway and I get that handout. I call my grandma and I say, Graham, you're never going to believe it. You're so proud of me. I have a new piano. I have the start of a studio. She said, how much did you spend? <laughs> and I said, well, what on earth? How are you going to pay? I said, Graham, chill out. It's on a credit card. <laughs> she said, what's the interest? Read the papers. Tell me. What's the interest? I said, something like 21%. It's fine. <laughs> that was her reaction, too. But I didn't know what interest was. And I had an undergraduate degree in business, for God's sakes. And she said, Alyssa, I'm going to mail you pre-stomped envelopes so you can send me my payments across the next five years, and I'm mailing you a check for the difference. She said, you're paying that credit card off. Grandma to the rescue. Everyone can give her a round of applause. So here we were, the start of my dream studio. That's me and what I would make my bedroom. So you're supposed to put luggages up there, right? And because I was so eager and passionate and trusting in the process, I wanted to make as much of my little tiny space for my teaching as possible. And I also felt a bit ashamed. I didn't want people to know that I had to live in my business. And so I concealed my life to this little tiny cubby where I had about three feet of clearance from my head to the ceiling every night. And then I put Christmas lights for my lighting up there. Yeah. So that was my bedroom. And I don't know how many people knew that, but I certainly knew that about two years later when I kept waking up with bruises on my forehead because I would forget the ceiling was so small. So I was walking through, who was the piano factory? Yeah, okay. Hi. And this is no dig on the piano factory, okay? But real stuff happened. We're going to get real here. So, uh, so. I was walking by a woman who was moving out of her unit. I said, you know, it's time for me to have a real bedroom. I deserve a real bedroom. And she had a two-bedroom two unit. And so I did back of the, the napkin math, and I said, okay, if I get a few more clients, I can afford the difference here. And I did. And what's really cool is that this door right here leads to what was supposed to be my bedroom. But what did I do? I hired somebody and gave them out of their teaching room. So what did I do instead? I lived in the walk-in closet. So you can't really see the walk-in closet from here, but it's a walk-in closet. It was big enough to fit a full-size mattress that I would put in and out every single day and night for another two years. And again, I pretended I didn't live there because I didn't want anyone to know that I didn't have the means to do that. But I gotta tell you guys something. Even though I take the mattress out and I would sleep on the kid mats, which were in the other, the other room, I loved my life. I was genuinely happy. How does that make sense, right? These are things that people wouldn't imagine doing or they feel like they're beneath. But I would do that every single day, and that's exactly what got me to where I am today because I loved it. When we're living in a path that's authentic to who we are, the joy makes it all make sense. And so continuing to trust in the process 
and continuing to feel like I really needed uh, apartment, I decided to go. Uh, there's the adults as well. I wanted to make a quick mention that we had a blossom adult community at this point as well. I decided to make a leap to a new space. This was a three room operation in the piano factory now. So, so far the journey one room, two rooms, three rooms, none of which had a real bedroom. And then I got my own apartment. So, I have to tell you guys this I, I, I toured through my very first apartment, and it was uh, the first one was 500 square feet. And the, the realtor said, uh, yes, I said, gosh, this is so big. What do people do in this space? What are they putting in here? I was completely overwhelmed with 500 square feet of personal living space. He said, well, we do have micro studios that are like 350. It's perfect for me there. And so I moved into my very first apartment in 2016. Y'all, round of applause. <laughs> no more living in the closet or storage. It was great. And I, I have to laugh because when I moved in, I brought my mattress and a few garbage bags of clothes. So when you live in a closet, you don't really own much, right? But the piano factory caught on pretty quickly to, uh, to this growing operation that I had here and the fact that I was not living in what was supposed to be a live-work situation. Not to mention, probably we had about 70 clients in and out of here, and at this point, I had hired five teachers. So let's talk about trust for one second before we keep moving in the story. Um, who is a solopreneur in the room? Yes, yes. It's, it's a big order, right? It's a lot of pressure. And a lot of times we feel like, if I don't show up today, you know what's going to happen? So we have a choice. Do we want to keep our art to ourselves, or do we want to take a risk and trust others and hire so that they can come in and do some of the work with us? So I exercise trust on a lot of levels with others, which was very difficult for me to do because of many circumstances in my first 20 years of life. But I did it. I did it. And it was the start of me having something that was much bigger than what I could singly offer to my community. So I'm so glad that that happened. And um, I do want to apologize publicly to those people that I employed first. I was not a very good manager, but thank you for bearing with me. So this was such a beautiful accumulation now of trust in process, trust in others, and I'm starting to get some trust in myself at this point. This was also a special time because I took to the streets of not only Boston, but ended up going around the US, and I was up for a challenge, a social challenge. I wanted to see if I could teach hundreds of strangers how to teach the piano, or how to, how to play the piano, uh, and I wanted to connect everybody's hands together to create one song. My goal in this movement was to give people the opportunity to experience playing, to understand that music is for them. Because I think there's a lot of barriers around art and people feeling such accessibility for themselves. So I wanted people to understand that if they just play one key, that could lead to so many more things, right? And so I'm just going to play a really brief snippet here. This was the very first, uh, very first event that I ran in Copley Square. Uh, it ended up going viral, which is super cool. And that led to me being able to do this in um, Colorado. 16th Street Mall, Boca Raton, Downey Beach, uh, DC, there was a monument that we set up, but that was pretty cool. Um, if we had audio, we would hear all of these hands playing a composition that I had written. And I, after these events, would be feeling so inspired. One, as a teacher, knowing that I could reach so many people instantaneously, but two, knowing that a lot of these people would leave this event learning music and going about their life in a very different way. So that leads me to one other thought here. We underestimate the impact that we have as artists, yeah? You never know that through your art, your authenticity, what that's gonna do for someone, what that's gonna set in motion. There are so many brilliant, beautiful things that you can do just by being you, and we don't see that. We don't see that. All right, we're moving forward here. Let's see if I can get this slide. Uh -huh. So this was the final space. Everything's going well. Oh my goodness, kids are having such a great time. We've got very happy adults here now. A couple of special shout outs. This is a dear mentor, Kitty Green, a dear mentor of mine, and a huge reason that I was able to navigate some of the future challenges we're about to get into. This right here, this woman is sitting right there in the white. Her name is Oxan. She's my dear bestest friend. And goodness, guys, I met her through my business, through doing what I love. So when we do what we love, we a lot of really cool things happen. Okay, 
I come back from a trip to Portugal, and there is a notice under my door. Everything was hunky dory, and it said, You're out. Your business is done. You have 30 days to shut down. Thanks, Piano Factory. So I'm freaking out, as anybody would. And I'm thinking, What am I going to do? And somehow I signed an agreement that said I'd be out by September or I'd go to jail. <laughs> I'm not sure why I did that, everyone. You know, that was not a very, a very good trust building moment in myself. And the time started ticking. I didn't know that to find commercial space in Boston, it takes an average of a year and a half. And I had nine months. All right. So a lot of things started happening. Also, her health started declining at the same time. So it was like 2018. It was rough. It was rough. It was one of those moments like you just want to crawl in a corner and never come out. And uh, so day release signing comes, it's July. I'm pretty sure that we have a solution. And the guy backs out. The guy backs out. He said, no, we're not doing a deal, which left me with another three months to find a space. And so we are touring aggressively. We got 200 no's. No one wants musicians in their building, come to find out. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? I literally thought my business was about to be rendered homeless. I had no idea. And so we end up in a, a business in uh, downtown crossing, West Street. Who knows the area of downtown crossing? Yeah, perfect. So we're there. And the guy that I showed you here in the bottom left is walking with me through the rubble. And he said, what do you think? Could this work, Dan? Could this work? And he said, well, let's go have a chat. So we're sitting in the Boston Commons. He said, how many clients do you have? I don't know. How much do you make? I don't know. How much do you spend? I have no idea. So I was like, do not sign this lease. Do not sign it. Do not whatever you do. Let's take some time. Let's get the numbers down. I sign it. <laughs> Again, unhinged, unhinged. And a lot of trust in myself, apparently. Um, come to find out, I signed a lease that would require four times, just four times alone in rent payments more than what we were doing in the South End. Total expenses probably more like five or six times what we were facing at the other location. And I had no business plan for how we were going to generate more clients. Uh, like, if any of my clients that I'm consulting with right now ever came to me and said, this was their story, I'd say, stop it. Nope, nope. There's so many things we're going to do together. There's time. We can do this. Ooh. So I had a couple weeks to raise $100,000 to manage this bill, though. I maxed out a bunch of credit cards, and I depleted all my accounts. I had about $103 to my name back in November of 2018. And I'm not... Kidding you guys, so remember this woman, remember how she bailed me out with the pretty stamped envelopes? Trust in the universe, here we go. My grandma passed throughout that time, and I had to still come up with quite a bit of money, in my opinion at this point, quite a bit of money for the security deposit. If we didn't come up with it, the deal would have probably gone south. And her inheritance hit the day before I owed, it was almost the exact dollar. I'm, I have chills it's absolutely bizarre um and it's interesting to me that she continued to help me even after she passed right she was the reason for that very first piano for that very first place the beginning of it all and she became the reason that we're where we are now so another round of applause for Graham. isn't this amazing gosh you guys like as i was going through these pictures yesterday it was such a gift because we forget all the steps that we take in becoming who we are. Ah, it's possible. And we're in a beautiful space. So now we get to do really fun things that I always dream of. Remember when I got fired from Berkeley because I was writing my business plan? This was what I was writing about. And a decade later, it finally happened. Isn't this fun? Yes. Yes, see these smiling faces and their lives are changing. Maybe they're not becoming professional musicians, but maybe they experience joy that puts them on a path of their own that's going to be forever different than if they hadn't otherwise come and partnered and made some music with us. All right, we're moving on in the journey here. So let's see next. One of my favorite things is I was just looking at the photos. This is 2016, my very first what we call a happy hour. This is like a social we do for our adult musicians. 
conversations. And speed ahead. This was literally a couple months ago, our most recent happy hour position. It's like, um, look, at this is just our adults, right? Just our adults and a fraction of our community because not everybody shows up. Isn't that cool to see the growing impact and reach that all started with a little trust? A lot of trust. <laughs> Today, we get to affect over 200 music-loving members. We offer a lot of piano, voice, and guitar classes. I have a team of 17. And we get to do a lot of really cool things. So as I recap the last, you know, the last journey that we just went through together, and I think about trust, there are so many moments. Trust, did you guys catch trust in self was a huge one. But, you know, it's funny. I almost think that that kind of, it may come last. It may come when you review the photos of 10 years of your life. And it's kind of a little bit like blindly walking forward, blindly walking forward. Trust in others. You have to. You got to let that go. You know, you got to let other people step in and help. And if you get burned, you get burned. You don't trust them again. But you don't stop trusting others, right? Because your mission is much bigger than just you. And if you don't learn to trust, it becomes contained to just you make impact, you have to trust others. Trust in the process. That was there from the beginning. You know, sleeping in the storage, sleeping in a walk-in closet, moving up, figuring out the debts, figuring out how to get myself out of a pickle that I signed myself up for. I was all about the process. But trust in the universe, oof, so many occurrences that were out of my hands, much bigger than myself. And I think we all have that if we just dare to lean into what is authentically us. And so when I looked up the, the definition, as the kind of type A person I am, as Sophie is telling me, the theme is trust. And, okay, what is trust? Isn't that funny? I had to do a, a little search of the definition on Google. It said that trust is the firm belief in the reliability, the truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. I hope that you will all find that and that you allow not only yourself and your process and others and big you or your greater force, but I hope that you'll allow your art to be the anchor of it all. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you.